Um, he is going to be preaching for us tonight, continuing our Matt series. Can you guys please put your hands together for the one and only Matt Bankston. Awesome. I'm just going to pray for him if that's all right. All right, let's get it central. Ben's been spoken about this. All right, here we go. All right, will you join me as we pray for Matt? Father God, we thank you for Matt. We thank you for the person that he is, the blessing he is to so many of us. We thank you for the many hours of time he's put into preparing this message, but also for the years and years of relationship he has walked with you that has led to a moment such as this where he can share with us things that he has learnt and been reflecting on and discovered about you and who you are and what it means to be your people. I pray that you'll give him the words to speak and that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to share with us tonight through Matt. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Laura. Oh, sorry. No, no, all good, all good. Hello, Nightlife. How are we all doing? Good. That's good to hear. I'm just going to get set up in here for a second. I'm going to put a timer on so you guys aren't sitting here for three hours. It's only an hour and a half message, so you don't have to sit for that long. I'm kidding. It's not. Um, Ben would probably not ever let me back up here again if it was an hour and a half. Um, but good evening. If you haven't met me yet, I'm Matt, uh, one of the young adults here. Um, and I must say, I'm, I'm incredibly honoured for the opportunity to be able to share here tonight. Um, I count it as a real, real honour to be able to actually do this. Um, and yeah, um, as Laura said, we're continuing the Matt series tonight. We Matt, had Matt Horsey last week. Um, and so I'm excited to be the next part of that. But I just want to start off tonight um, just by saying a massive thank you to Russell and Nikki, Ben and Tamara and Alex. Um, you all passed to the church so, so well. Um, I'm blessed and honored to call this place my home, call this my family. I'm thankful that you guys um, develop and grow us and lead us well, um, that you're setting up the next generation um, and just being great people in general. Um, for those who don't know as well, Ben and Tamara are celebrating their 10th year wedding anniversary this sort of yesterday, two days ago. Um, very, very exciting. So if you get a chance, shoot them a text because um, 10 years is a pretty awesome thing. But so we've been having a little bit of an unofficial series the last few weeks. Um, Matt mentioned it last week, but it's sort of talking about um, your lifestyle and how your actions and choices can impact your life and lead you to different decisions and different outcomes. Um, so Tamara spoke a few weeks ago on the stamp you're making on your life through your choices um, and how your actions can lead to a positive stamp or a negative stamp. Um, Matt Horsey last week spoke on, I want to get this right, um, the life, uh, turning your life into the life your dreams are made of. How's it go again, Horsey? He's, he's bailed. Anyway, it's basically giving you the life of what you're dreaming for, like how you can, what you're dreaming for, what your goals are, how you can actually get there and achieve that. Um, and Shane Willard actually spoke here at Nightlife a few weeks ago and spoke on the um, idea of how choices can either be light or dark or choices that make life or death. Um, and so I've loved all these messages the last few weeks because they not only have an incredible biblical teaching, but they actually have a biblical principle uh, that we can outlive and live through our lives. Um, and so tonight um, I'd like to talk a little bit more on faith. Um, and how faith can impact not only your, your outcomes in your, in your life, but on the plans you have in your life as well. Um, and I'd like to pray again. Uh, you can never have too much prayer before we open into a little bit more scripture. Uh, but so, Heavenly Father, I, um, I thank you for tonight, Lord. Uh, I thank you for the church we get to call home. I thank you for every person in this room. And so, Father, I pray that as I speak tonight, that it won't be my words, but it will be your words that flow through me, God. Um, I pray that... Uh, May hearts tonight hear what they need to hear. May eyes be open to what you want to see. Um, and show us tonight something new from this scripture, God. Help us to just read this and, and apply it to our lives um, as we look through your word tonight. Amen. So let's get into it. Let's open the Bible. We're going to look at the book of Mark, chapter 5. Um, and I'd like to read you one story which actually contains two stories. Uh, it's, I like to call it a little sandwich. 
Um, it's quite a big chunk. It's verses 21 to 43, but stick with me. I'll try and make it entertaining. I like to think I'm a pretty you know, upbeat kind of guy, um, so it might make it a little bit easier for you. Um, but there is so much we can unpack from this story. And just to give a little bit of context before we jump fully into it, because um, context is so key. So Jesus at this point had already begun his ministry. He's already beginning to preach. Uh, he's already beginning to tell parables and teach uh, the people a new way of life. Um, he's already begun healing people, um, doing miracles, casting out demons, and already has quite a large following um, and words spreading around sort of the local towns about what he was doing. And so Jesus, Jesus and the 12 disciples um, were actually just presently on a lake. They'd just come back from performing another miracle, and this is where we can pick up the story. And so when Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him um, while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jarius uh, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him, and the large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she actually grew worse. And when she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? And his disciple replied, You see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to had seen who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. And while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jarius, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid, just believe. And so from here, he did not let anyone except Peter, James, and John follow him. And so when they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a big commotion with people crying, crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. After he took them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talith kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Jesus gave strict orders to not let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So I know a massive chunk of scripture. Thank you very, very much for sitting through that. Uh, but there is quite a lot within that story. First, we have the story of Jarius and his daughter. Uh, and then we have the story of the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And then back to the story of Jarius. See a little, little sandwich, you got the bread, meat, bread. Um, but I'd like to break it down to see what we can actually learn from these two stories and how we can actually apply something to our lives through these. And so let's start at the beginning. Let's start with Jarius. So he was a synagogue leader, uh, a leader of the Jewish faith, um, almost a Jewish pastor, if you will, to make it easier. Um, and so Pharisees and Jewish leaders, they weren't often known for liking Jesus very much or at all. Um, simply because in the fact that Jesus was actually teaching a new way of life that disregarded the law that they held on to so tightly. And they held on to it because basically it gave them a position of power over the people. And so we don't know the exact relationship between Jesus and Jarius, but um, Jesus was teaching in the town that Jarius was actually located from. So um, Jarius would have seen or heard at least of some of the miracles that he would have been performing. And so Jarius was clearly in a dire position, a father who would do anything to save his daughter. We read that he said, his little daughter is dying. Please come put your hands on her so that she will be healed and lived. Obviously, Jarius demonstrated faith through this statement. He believed what he had heard or have seen, uh, that Jesus could actually heal her. 
And as we read, Jesus agrees to go with him and the crowd follows as well because they can't get enough of Jesus. And anyone who's been in a crowd, you know, cramming out of a small door or whatever it may be, knows that it's never easy to move and it's slow, pushy, and it slows down your trip by a lot. Like walking into a concert, it's like two seconds, walking out, you know, you're there for 40 minutes. Um, But then we actually get paused to be interrupted by the second part of this story, Uh, an interruption for the journey of Jarius and Jesus, the meat in the sandwich, if you will. Uh, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And again, I want to give context to this because context brings so much information to the Bible. Um, Within Jewish culture, people and objects were often in a state of being clean or unclean ceremonially. The Jews would have to go through um, ceremonial rituals, weekly, monthly, whatever it may be, um, performing sacrifices or cleansing of some form to basically make you clean again, um, with different rituals for different cleansings that needed to be fulfilled. Oh, thank you so much. Um, And so what this meant is that actually when a woman was bleeding, uh, she was considered unclean, someone who cannot be touched, um, as anything that she touched would have become unclean. And so now this woman had been bleeding for 12 years. The actual closer depiction or translation is a hemorrhage, um, but still bleeding for 12 years is pretty rough. Um, But people would have known who she was from the culture that they had. Uh, People would have been told to keep away from her, that they can't touch her, that they can't see her, whatever it may be. Um, Plus, she would already be known by the medical community as well because we read that she had seen doctors and tried medical trials for many, many years. And all these things had actually never improved her but had only made her worse. And so for 12 years, she was left in a state of pain, not only socially but physically as well. And so, yeah, that's 12 years of being in physical pain 12 years of being known as unclean, 12 years of social and religious isolation, being an outcast of society. Her very presence in that crowd would have been frowned upon. She probably would have been abused for being there. I could only imagine how she would have felt what her self-worth would have been. And so she's also heard of what Jesus can do. And she thought, if I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Man, what faith. The faith she has, her only hope that she can really see, something that actually completely defies logic. If she'd never seen Jesus heal someone, she's simply going off the word of what someone else has said. And she still had the faith to, uh, to deal with being abused and ridiculed for being there. It was a healing that was supernatural and defied logic. And so I just want to read over verse 28 to 30 and then 32 to 34 again. So when she heard about Jesus, she came from the crowd and thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt that in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone from him and he turned around and asked, who touched my clothes? And so Jesus kept looking around to ask who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And so there's a few key points I really want to actually pull out from those scriptures. And so the first, which I think I have up there now, is that her faith was solely in Jesus. She knew that she would be healed. She had faith that she would be healed. Enough that she pursued him, even when everything else before had failed, even when she knew she would have been ridiculed for being there, she still reached out. Secondly, She was healed immediately. Not slowly, not after a few days, that second, that instant, she was freed from her physical suffering. She felt in her body all was well. Where man had failed, God didn't. Years of failed treatment and medicine only left her worse, but the simple act of touching Jesus immediately brought restoration to her entire body. Third, where religiously... Whenever she touched something, it became unclean. And so for the last 12 years of her life, anything she touched became unclean. People, items, whatever it was. How amazing is it that when Jesus is involved, it flips. His holiness in his purity, she was the one who became clean. And fourth, Jesus did more than actually just heal her physically in that moment. Jesus realized something had actually happened. 
uh, he didn't have to actually find out really what happened because he already knew. But he knew what he was actually doing in this moment. If she had simply slipped away back into the crowd, snuck away, who actually would have believed her? 12 years she had been known as the woman who had been bleeding. 12 years an outcast. Would her family have actually let her back in? Would society have accepted her? Would they have believed her story? And so when Jesus actually called her out, even though she was trembling with fear, he was actually doing something far more than just restoring her body physically. But he was able to restore her socially, religiously, and emotionally. But it took a step of courage from her. She still could have hidden. She still could have let it slide. But without knowing what Jesus was about to do, she still kept her faith in him. And so, as I read, she still fell at his feet in fear, and she told him everything. And within this, everyone around in the crowd would have heard this too. So, she would have explained her uncleanliness to everyone there, her life of being shunned, rejected, and ignored. But in this, we actually read that Jesus never rushed her. It doesn't say that Jesus cut her off halfway. It doesn't say that Jesus said, nah, you can just tell me, you know, skip to the good part. So he, she, he told her the whole truth, or she told him the whole truth, sorry. It's kind of easy to forget that Jesus was actually on his way to a dying young girl because he's so focused on this one life, the restoration of this one nameless woman. And in a beautiful moment, after listening to her, letting her tell her story, Jesus done something extraordinary past this. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This is so important because in this moment of restoration, he commends her for her faith and he actually calls her daughter. This is the only time that Jesus refers to someone specifically by the name of daughter. As someone who had probably been abandoned by her family years and years ago, it's probably not a name she would have heard in a long, long time. Daughter, it's a sweet, intimate name, one that is calling her beloved to Jesus and actually joins her to the family of Christ. And so we could actually almost just stop the sermon there, you know, 15 minutes in, call it a day. But, you know, we're all in need of healing, depiction of Father's love for us, wrap it up, call it quits. But there's still more I think we can actually get from this story. In this moment of Jesus Jesus restoring this woman, uh, a member of Jairus' household came up and told the news that his daughter is dead, that there is no point in bothering Jesus anymore. Can you imagine how Jairus would have felt in that moment? His faith that he once had in Jesus is being tested and pushed to its ultimate limits. His daughter, his beloved, is dead. The faith that he had in Jesus that he could have healed her, that he could have saved her, crushed in an instant. How would have you felt? Hurt? Confused? Angry? I think that's completely understandable. You just saw Jesus heal some random woman who was an outcast, a nobody, and he gave her all his attention, all his time to let her tell her story. But your daughter, I'm a synagogue leader, is now dead. Was it really worth it? Why not me, Jesus? Why not my dreams? Why couldn't you help me? Maybe you guys even feel like this right now. Do you feel like God has helped someone else instead of you? Do you feel overlooked? Has your faith slipped away because it hasn't gone to your plans? Are you no longer believing in what God is going to do through you because it isn't going the way you thought it was? And so this is actually an incredible part of the story, and I love how it all ties it together. And so, again, context-wise, I love context, it's so good in the Bible, but Jesus being a rabbi was ceremonially clean basically all the time. He had to be. Um, And clean people weren't actually allowed in the presence of a dead body until it had gone through its cleaning rituals itself. And so they weren't even allowed in the same room. Even if Jesus tried to go into that room, the people wouldn't have let him. And so when Jarius had heard that his daughter had passed, that was it, his final chance to get to Jesus into the room, to heal her, to, to lay his hand on her, to restore her, was gone. In that moment, in Jarius's mind, death had the final say 
death had stamped its name on her life. And so we don't know everything that Jarius had said in that moment or what he felt in his heart or what he thought. But Jesus simply says in this moment of turmoil in his heart, don't be afraid, just believe. I'm sure that in that moment, that would have been the last thing you wanted to hear. How can I believe? How can I not be afraid? The worst case scenario that I could ever have thought of, my baby girl, my daughter is dead. for a second there. And so when Jesus was actually touched by the woman, and so this was in the view of all the people uh, within that crowd, Jesus was actually considered in the view of the law that he was unclean. And so in that beautiful moment of these two stories crossing over, Jesus was actually able to enter the room because of this other woman's actions. And so if that woman did slip away, if she didn't tell her story, Jesus wouldn't have been allowed into that room to touch the life of this little girl. Isn't it amazing when God touches your life that he's actually able to touch someone else's through your story as well? If we jump to verse 38 to 42... When they, came home, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion and people crying and wailing. And he said to them, why all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. And so he took them all out and just took the father and mother into the room, the ones that called the daughter beloved. And the disciples were in there with him. And he was able to take her by the hand and say, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she did. She stands and walks around. Amazing. What a roller coaster of a story. In this story, we have two nameless female characters, both supernaturally and fully restored to the name of daughter through Jesus. Death did not have the final say. And so how many times in the Bible do we read, of lives completely turned around through Jesus and through God and all his plans. But how often do they ever go to the plans of those involved? I mean, just looking at the New Testament, the Jews thought Jesus was going to be some mighty king, a conqueror of the Roman Empire, someone to take them out. But they completely missed Jesus as a common man. In the story of Lazarus, Jesus was late. Mary even said to him, if you had only been here sooner, you could have saved him. But how much more amazing is Jesus raising a dead man to life than just healing a sick man? And Jarius in this story that we just read, sure his plan definitely wasn't that his daughter was going to die. But Jesus was still able to perform an incredible miracle. And above that, Who would have thought that Jesus dying on a cross was going to lead to our salvation? I mean, even the 12 disciples who followed him for three years, watched countless miracles and healings, abandoned hope after Jesus died. It didn't go the way they thought it would. How many times have you, or I know I have, tried to rush what Jesus has planned for our lives How many times have we thought up plans thinking, hey God, this is my plan, you should follow it. And yet in all those situations in the Bible we just read, they always turned out way better than what they would have ever planned on their own. And yet somehow we still think that we have a better plan than God. I know I've had many, many seasons in my life of doubt and of wondering why it's not going to my plan whether it be work or even worship, whatever it may be. And I'm like, God, I thought we made a deal. I was like, I told you what I wanted. And that was the end of the story. You should have followed through. Why not? I, have, I think I have a pretty good plan for my life, don't I? I know, I, mean, I know what I need. But then when it comes to that point where it doesn't go my way, my faith takes a hit. It takes a knock. It's taken down a notch. My faith is hurt. I found found this in my journey 
personally way too many times to count and yet I still find myself going back to the same position of I know best. Have you found this in your own life? Do you feel like Jarius? You have your goal, your dream, where you want Jesus to go with you, but there may have been a few extra stops along the way that you didn't account for. Maybe you're walking in the wrong direction and Jesus is waiting to cut back, but you're just confused why you're going this way. Maybe you've just heard basically what Jairus' servants had said to him, saying, why bother the teacher anymore? Hope is gone. You're too focused on the healing you want, on the goal that you have, trying to rush Jesus that you actually miss the beauty in what Jesus is doing with you along the way. And so what I've learned in my, in my many, many years of life and all my mature wisdom that I have, I don't, is that Jesus is never in a rush. And it honestly frustrates me so much. But he knows the plans. He knows our heart. He knows where we're going to go before we do. And yet, I still want to jump ahead. But I can tell you tonight that he does have a plan. He has a purpose for where you are at right here, right now. He's never too busy for you. I know you may feel forgotten. I know you may feel left to the side because he's doing something with someone else or that's all you can see. But he's never rushed to finish a work through you as well. James 1, 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And so if I can get the band back up or just Joel, um, I just want to leave you guys with a bit of self-reflection tonight in this moment. How's your faith? Are you holding strong? Are you firm in what you believe? Are you happy with where your journey is going so far? Are you actually taking delight in the detours that Jesus is taking you on at the moment? If so, great. That's awesome. I wish I could be there all the time with you, but stay there. Keep your faith strong. And maybe you're in a position that's closer to Jarius, where things aren't going to the plan that you thought out. You're struggling because you're focused on where you think God should be. And because you're focusing so much on where you think God should be, you're completely missing the fact that he's actually trying to do something over here through you. And I just want to encourage you tonight, if you're in that place, don't give up. Philippians 1 verse 6, be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until the... Com uh, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the Bible still has power even when I start up. And so no matter where you are on your path, God has an amazing plan for you. It may not be going the exact way that you want it to right now, but take hope in the fact that he is completing a good work in you and that through the testing of your faith, you actually become mature and complete. He's leading you to something much greater than you could ever imagine. And so tonight, I actually just want to take a quick moment just to pray for people who are in that situation, who feel that they're there. They don't need hands raised. They don't, don't want anything. This is, this is between you and God. Do you feel like you've been neglected a bit? Do you feel like you can't see where God is at the moment? And I want to pray for you. If you feel like you're lost on this journey, if you feel like you're sick of these plans not working, I want to pray for you. So Heavenly Father, tonight, 
For anyone in this room who is feeling distant, who is feeling confused or lost with where you're leading them, God, who are confused with what you're doing on their journey so far, Father, I pray for a supernatural hope. I pray for courage. I pray for strength. And I pray for faith. Fill them tonight, God. Fill them afresh. May you just show them a glimpse of what's ahead so that they may take hope in where you're leading them. Or maybe you um, aren't following Jesus at all tonight. Maybe you haven't even started your journey with Jesus. I'd actually like to just give you an opportunity tonight to give your life to him as well. Because maybe you are in that place where you've had your plans and you just don't understand why it's not going the way it should. And you've tried so many times to make your life work. We read before that death death isn't the end for Jesus. We sung it before as well. Even with that little girl, death didn't hold her, but Jesus did. Death isn't the end for us either when we're in Christ. We have a hope and a faith that through Jesus' death and his resurrection, that we have an eternal life after our time on earth. And so if this is you in this house where you haven't ever accepted Jesus into your heart and and you want to take that first step, this prayer is for you. And so I just ask you that you just follow along in your heart. You can say it out loud if you want, but... um, Just pray along with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have good plans for my life and that they are better than my own. I trust my life to you and ask that you restore me just as you did the woman and that girl. I ask that you forgive me of my sins and enter my heart. Help me to live a life that follows you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Laura.